Hello ladies and gentlemen, here is still one chapter to come from Basics of Business Administration, which I promised you a long time ago and then have probably simply forgotten, because um, there is a chapter 3 which is about the right location for an enterprise. As you always know from my introductory small lectures, this is really basics of basics of basics. Huh? One might even say lowest level or even lower than beginner's level, but just to give you a nice idea. So the decision which we have to have a look at now is simply where we are going to place our enterprise. So that's a decision which you usually only take in the beginning or when you decide to expand your enterprise. So it happens very, very rarely and probably once you decided to build a factory site at a certain location, uh, you are bound to that decision for a very long time. So how do we have to decide that? Naturally. We learned about decisions, there are three determinating factors. The aims, the alternatives which you have, and number, th <laughs> number three. No? Um, number three is the foreseeable consequences of the actions which you can take, so of your alternative. What is going to happen if I decide for Germany? What is going to be the consequences if I decide for Western Sahara? What is going to be the, the foreseeable consequences of my decision if I decide for England, USA, Australia, or whatever? Mm -hmm. So, my aim is plain and simple. I want to maximize my profit, because um, that's probably not my only aim, but um, we just define the business as an institution which has the aim to generate profit. So we can be sure when we discuss about all businesses all in the world, at least they have one aim in common which they share, they want to make profit and so if we want to serve this aim best, then the natural conclusion is how can we locate our enterprise in a way that the chances to achieve profit are the best ones, so that profit will be highest. Well. Let's have a look. The possible alternatives which we have can be viewed on a different um, uh, you can focus on different entities. You can uh, take countries or states into consideration but then naturally you cannot just leave it at that level. Well, for example if you opt for Germany well there are a huge amount of cities so you would have to find out where could I place, where in Germany could I place my factory, um, which requirements have to be met, which possibilities are left over. For example, I need a free area to build a factory on it. Well, that's in certain states and certain regions not easily available. So I have to look which possibilities exist. And yeah. Naturally, there is another thing. Um, you can either say, I place everything which has to be done at one location, at one simple place. Um, so the whole enterprise at one place. Uh, on the other hand, you also have the alternative to split up all the labor and the activities which have to be done and to say, okay, certain steps of the production will be done in Malaysia, others will be done in Australia, and another part of my activities will have to be done in Germany. Also, that is possible. So, when you decide over the um, location of your enterprise, you also have to decide if you all do it at one place or if you split it up. By the way, um, in the course of time, probably the decisions which enterprise owners tend to make will differ. If you look, for example, into history, in former times very often everything was at one single place. 
Uh, nowadays, you have more and more of a trend to globalization. Uh, it's no longer even a trend, it is a fact. Um, very often you have that, where activities are widespread and distributed all over the world. Um, now one asks oneself, why do they decide differently today than in former times? And the answer is, well, if you think of it, aims are the same. Alternatives have become more, because in former times, for example, uh, 150 or 200 years ago, the alternative for a German to set up a firm in Australia would not have realistically existed. Probably you would have even been um, legally forbidden to do so in many cases in many countries. So the possibilities, the range of possibilities has widened enormously. And another aspect, um, also it depends from the consequences. And if you see, if you make a look to the cost consequences, um, what would you have to do if you split up the production and, and distribute it all over the world? You would have to transport the half-finished products from here to there and so. And so the transport possibilities and the transportation costs also naturally if they vary they bring new alternatives into existence from which you then also can choose and that is a reason why if for example you look through history you see that economic behavior changes even in the organization of the firm um, okay but this makes explicable why, for example, answers to the same problem at different times in history are different, because the alternatives and the conditions, the consequences of the alternatives, be vary and naturally different set of conditions for a decision, different outcome. It's like an equation, different value for the variables, other result. So you can, with our simple history, um, theory on decision, even from hindsight, try to understand historical developments. But, okay, now that was <laughs> enough uh, of, of talking about things. Let's go a bit more into details. No? Um, when we use that decision theory again, then, apart from the aims, you also have to find out the potential consequences of your alternative. So you must carefully analyze what will be the consequences of investing at a certain place. And now, because this is a long-term decision, you decide now to build a factory here. This will be finished in five or ten years then you will be bound to use it. You don't burn it down the next day. So probably for 10 or 20 years after that, you will be bound to that place. So it would not be sufficient to be able to foresee the consequences of your decision to invest at a certain place for the next two or three years. You need to be able to form a relatively pricey precise idea of what is going to happen there in the next 20 or 30 years. Now, this explains automatically why um, countries flourish if there is a stable political and economic um, surrounding, whereas countries where you have a very, very unsecure set of conditions. No. One never knows in that country what's going to happen tomorrow. Strike, civil war, um, everything in the country is turned from the right to the left. And uh, This is naturally something where you get reluctant. Think, ah, mm -hmm. Because then the, um, the, pro the ability to prognosticize what will be the outcome of your decision is far too low or is reduced and 
that makes your decision more risky. It's like driving into um, misty and nebulous weather. You, you have an idea of a direction, but you never know if something is going to hit you while you drive on that street, or if the street will be still there in 10 meters. So you probably try to opt for the clear road. And um, you should not underestimate this. Uh, that's why when you read newspapers very often, political discussion is about stability of conditions in the country and that if you want to make the country more attractive then you need stable conditions, a stable political system like a stable democracy and some things in that uh, direction too. Um, yeah, good. Now when it comes to looking to consequences. Um, you, in, you are interested naturally in everything which um, might play a role. So the natural conditions you will look to. What is concerning raw material? Can I get my raw material at the place where I need it? Or at least can I bring it there? And if I need to bring it there, what will that cost? Um, does it, how enormous is the difference between having to bring, let's say, the raw material for, stop, for steel production over 10,000 of kilometers or having them directly at hand. That naturally depends on the transportation costs or workers. Imagine the thing which you desperately need is qualified workers. Um, have you ever wondered about the fact that if you have a university um, and they have a very strong, let's see, IT research department and they have very good um, study programs in IT and Internet and all that stuff. Did you ever wonder why it then happens after a while that more and more firms settle down near that university area of that city? The answer is well. Um, you desperately need qualified workers, and there they are. Or Silicon Valley, um, there you need IT experts, and there they all live there. So, if you settle down there, you probably have a huge reservoir of potential employees. And if you bring some employees there, they will meet other employees deeply involved in knowledge in that field. So everywhere where they go out, they meet again other informatic people huh? and um, will probably be easy to obtain the necessary workers. If, for example, you desperately need some programming people, and you have the best location which you could imagine somewhere in the jungle sheep, land, free space, everything there. But you can't motivate your people to go there if they are a necessary factor. Forget about that location. Or find a solution to bridge the gap between I want to have my factory or my office building there, but my people don't want to go there. So it's always a question. And then you often have logistic questions to ask yourself. If, for example, you don't find all the necessary production factors at the one and same place, you have to bring some of them to that place. So transportation possibilities become a great question for you. And uh, you must be able to bring the raw material to the factory site. The question is, how long will the transport take? How costly will it be? And so on. Um, it might also be that when you, or it will also be the case that if your products are finished, you, you need to sell them naturally. So 
if your customers don't happen to live in your inside your factory building, that means you have to send your product to the customers or you have to motivate the customers to come to your factory, buy the stuff and take it home. So also the transportation opportunities for that task play a role. If you set up a factory at the best location you can imagine for production, then you can't simply not get rid of the finished products. Well, that is really a shot into the oven. You can't get rid of the stuff. Uh, that would be terror. So you have also to um, keep that in mind. And by the way, you usually should know that if you make plans for a huge product, a project, sorry, you naturally must yourself always ask one question, what can go wrong, what did I overlook, how can the whole idea break down and what's possible that might happen, what we have overlooked that ruins everything, but well, you see what you have to take into account. Then, apart from these natural conditions, um, the transportation opportunities, hmm? Um, you also have a legal framework. It might be that certain things are not allowed to be done at certain locations. For example, the slaughterhouse for cows, um, it will probably be a bad idea to set that up deep down in India where cows are um, seen as holy beings. You know, will probably entail some problems. Or if you come to the heroic decision that the best location for your new wine production is the middle of Tehran, um, then you will get some legal problems because this is not possible there. And you very often have legal restrictions. Hmm? Rules on employment security. Um, how do I have to safeguard the health of my employees? How, what do I have to do to prevent um, accidents? Hmm? 300 years ago, it was really phew, no surprise if when you went to a factory, they shouted around, again, somebody had died in an accident and nobody cared about that. It was just seen as natural. Shit happens. Hmm? Later, people began to do something against that. Naturally, very often that was under pressure from society or even um, under pressure by law from the state. Well, so, how strong are the conditions there? Um, employment contracts. Can you employ people and hire, hire them today and fire them tomorrow? Or do you have some social responsibility? Um, and how much is that enforced by law? Is there the possibility to do everything with your workers what you like? Or do they have a right to co-decide? Or better, the usual term would be to co-determination. So that you must involve them into in the finding of decisions which affect the... Um, total number of employees in their working conditions or so. Then, when you earn something, taxation plays a role, social security, is there compulsory health insurance, do you regard that as good for you? Yeah. Might be. If your employees don't show up when they are sick, yeah. You might regard that as negative, but if the first employee shows up with an infectious disease because he or she can't afford to stay at home and then infects your whole factory employees so that next week everyone is sick at home uh, or arrives in sick condition at the factory and produces things which are bad quality, then you probably deeply regret because that you don't have a well-working social net in your state where you invested. No? So, well, it all has um, an importance. The production process is sometimes um, regulated by law. Um, 
Very often there are restrictions on importation or exportation of raw products or finished products. Um, it is even still customary or possible in several states of the earth that you are not allowed to transfer capital out of that country to other countries without permission from the local authorities. Now imagine if you overlook such a nice thing. Um, so you invest somewhere, build a factory there, make profit there. Let's say 100 million units in the local currency and then naturally it only makes you happy when you can bring that money home and now you are forbidden to transfer that money from one bank in that country to the bank in your home country or you are forbidden to exchange it from their currency into your own currency so that you can spend it. Um, that would be a brutal surprise. So all these legal framework things have to be looked at. And also market conditions play a role, not only natural and legal conditions. Market conditions result from how people behave. Um, for example, what do workers demand for qualified or simple work? Uh, what are people willing to demand for transportation services? Um, how high uh, will the prices be which the consumers are willing to pay for your goods which you are going to sell them in that country or so? Um, all that can um, influence your decision. Again, you have to form an impression of many, many aspects which play a role for such a decision and you have to develop ideas of will that be the same during the next 20, 30, 40 years or will that change to the better or to the worse and is anything possible, any development which might ruin the whole advantages of this alternative? So all that play the role. When you now begin to select, it's all about costs. Profit is revenue minus costs, and naturally you want to decide for that location where the costs of that process procedures where the costs are minimal. Naturally, mm, feasibility is also a restriction. You can't opt for a location where your plans wouldn't work. So the first selection is probably, do you have any hard restrictions where you can rule out certain countries from the beginning, because then you don't need to waste thoughts and efforts on um, looking for details. If you just say certain alternatives do not exist. Um, if you have one aspect which says, okay, this country or this city or this place is out of consideration that simplifies matter. We can't do our stuff there. In former times, naturally, that restricted your choices strongly. Nowadays, you usually have the whole world in consideration. And so probably, even after ruling out some alternatives, you still have many alternatives left over. Um, let us again have a look which aspects might be relevant. We had a small overview over what happened in the enterprise. There was raw material and personnel. So we would have to look on all the conditions influencing these things at a location which you take into the focus. Or production. So you should think about everything which influences your possibilities and the costs of production at different locations. And naturally you need in the end to bring your things to the market. So also there, think about if I decide for a factory in Essen or in the Western Sahara or in Australia, how does that influence my chances to sell my products? Transport to the customers, 
that far or near are there. So natural transportation, uh, is it yeah, possible under natural yeah, conditions, okay? Are there legal restrictions to transport things from there to here? Uh, and all that can be so. so it's always a good idea to look to natural conditions, legal conditions, transport conditions, and whatever comes into your mind. And very often, if you look to where factories were placed in former times or today, you can even understand with a bit of additional information why people chose the location which they chose. For example, um, steel factories were in former times in Germany very likely to be concentrated near areas where you had mines for coal and iron. Because in steel you needed these two raw materials and at the time these things are heavy and you need much of them. So um, at the time the transportation costs were relatively um, expensive. Imagine even before the railroads were invented. So then transportation were real, was really, really hard. Um, so probably you decided to settle down with a factory building there where the raw materials and the, so the coal and the iron could be found. Because these were the most relevant and most difficult to transport raw materials. And so being near your raw material sources saved you the biggest amount of costs. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would probably not even have been feasible to transport the raw materials to your site and then um, to produce. Mm -hmm. um, now later, for example, Car factories also settled down in the rural area sometimes because, well, there was the steel available. And there were many workers available which longed to, or which were willing to take up simple but well paid jobs. Um, nowadays, transportation costs have dropped down enormously. You have today very relatively cheap uh, transportation opportunities by ship, by the way, in many cases when you look to a map, very often important industrial centers were near a river and it was usually a river which you can reach by ship because that was the most cheap, the most cheap, the cheapest and the most easy way to transport things during most uh, parts of history. So um, the transportation opportunities naturally, when they became better, easier, mm -hmm. then also the uh, potential choices for entrepreneurs changed enormously. Mm -hmm. So every innovation in the field of transportation changed the whole world potentially. Mm -hmm. Invention of railroads, mm -hmm. for example, before railroads were invented, um, it was difficult to establish a big factory, let's say an enormous factory-like slaughterhouse, and produce meat in mass production. After railroads were invented in America, a big center for um, meat production developed in Chicago, because now you could, tra could transport the meat from there and you could transport the cattle to there. And um, also a big innovation was when transportation of food was made easy because the f you developed inventions how the food didn't deteriorate because you could cool it down or so. Every time when transportation opportunities developed uh, and new inventions were made, the whole world changed because then the costs 
conditions completely changed and so different decisions became potentially possible and then were naturally also made. Okay. Um, naturally, you always have many things to keep, keep into account. Um, perhaps somewhere raw material is easy you know, available but the uh, land is extremely expensive, workers' wages are high, so raw material aspect is for the one location, the workers and the wages aspect is for the other one, and uh, then you would have to choose and to, depend, uh, to decide what is more important for you. Um, when it comes to labor and workers, I already told you, okay, um, if you need qualified workers, can you find them at the place, or can you motivate the people to go there? Hmm? This is one thing. Now, in the coronavirus crisis, we have seen that many jobs can also be done by home office. So, um, this surprising invention or detection might also change um, decisions where to place firms, because for certain jobs, one has now find, found out, okay, you can have these jobs done outside the firm, so where the people want to live. Um, that naturally enables you to place the rest of the firm somewhere where you could never have done it before. Um, yeah, so simple labor also. Um, how can I get my people to my factory if a well, simple, stupid, is it really stupid? I should not go deeply about it, um, but simple work, um, how can I get these people to my factory? Do they live there? Do they live in the surroundings? Um, if not, do I get the permission from the state to look for uh, such workers in other states? Do they get the visas or the permissions to move there and work for me? Oh, that's um, Yeah. Then, what is, for example, the working climate? If I can get my workers, but in a certain culture of a certain country or so, the, there is always a latent conflict between the employer level and the employee level. So strikes are frequent, um, you have social unrest, the trade unions are aggressive and don't cooperate, so um, that might affect your possibilities to, do, to get your work done there properly or easily. So, you will also look to that, because it might affect the feasibility or the, the costs, simply. Um, do your workers have rights for code determination? I learned from new sources that my first translation code decision was nice but wrong, so code determination would be the correct um, term. If workers have certain rights in a certain area under the local labor law or customs, how do they use it? Uh, so, are they really acting as partners or as enemies? Um, by the way, that can vary from firm to firm even because that's also um, that's not on only dependent from social or legal surroundings, but also from the individual mindset of the people involved. Um, I mentioned co-determination of workers. You should be familiar with that. Um, for in example, in Germany, after World War II, some years after World War II, we um, had now established a democracy, and then people found out, okay, and uh, now, in principle, we have the right to vote for a government every four years, but in our everyday life, we are the slaves of our employer from the beginning to the end of the day, because we have to do everything what the employer wants. And if we don't have a decent and nice employer, that can be a hardship. So, some people 
began to think about, is it really, um, yeah, can we really and say we enjoy now life in a democracy if in real life, in everyday life, we don't have to, any democratic rights. Our everyday life is our life in the firm. So we have to think about that more. And so can we create also some ways to co-decide or to have an influence on our everyday life in economy? And for that motivation, things like a workers' representative council was set up. And such a uh, workers' council then got the right to um, to be asked when certain um, decisions of the employer affected um, the working conditions of the workers in a way where um, the legislator regarded as as yeah as um, a good compromise that the workers should have a word in it. Mm -hmm. So the Workers' Council has then the function to um, safeguard the interest of the workers with respect to the boss. And um, also they have certain vetoing rights concerning certain decisions if the idea is this is something which fundamentally affects the working conditions and so the um, contract relationships where the workers signed for when they entered the firm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, later, there were um, there was naturally a development over time concerning that in the 1970s when it came um, to a, then it came to a further step concerning democratization of firms because at that time the social democratic government under, um, I believe it was Mr. Helmut Schmidt, decided to extend a bit the democratic character of firms. And they said even, or at least the, the very huge firms, the large firms are usually capital investment firms, AGs or so, where the relationship from between the shareholders and the firm is a rather distant one. So where they really are only capital contributors, whereas the workers spend their life completely or a huge part of the, their lives in the firm. So the influence of the workers was to be extended. And uh, the idea was then that up to half of the members of the supervisory board of an AG or of major GmbHs um, was to be filled with members elected by the workers. So the idea was the supervisory board is that governing body in German company law which elects the managing directors. And so the idea was the uh, workers' representatives should also have a, work in, a word in that. Um, so, indeed, um, there are German big firms where half of the worker, half of the members of the supervisory board, or one third of them, depending on the circumstances, has to be elected by a workers' representatives. So, very often you have trade union representatives in these supervisory boards. That, on the one hand, gives the workers a strong influence in the firms because they are members of that body which has to be informed by the managing directors. On the other hand, naturally, they are also bound in the decision-taking because if they have taken part in the decisions, Naturally, later they can't completely attack the decisions and compromises which they, together with the entrepreneur's side, have found in the deciding body. So, might be positive and negative aspects depending on the individual situation. Um, that co-determination of workers was originally, I believe, a German peculiarity. 
But um, you know that in the European Union, in the 80s and 90s, there was also a tendency to, um, yeah, to create also some social rights, not only to be good for the business owners, Europe should also bring some outcome for the average citizen. And so um, there was also a social aspect introduced in the treaty, especially that workers' rights should now be also an objective of EU policy. And so uh, there was some time in European directive which said that multinational or big European firms were obliged indeed to establish a European Workers' Council for large groups where the, um, the Workers' Councils of the individual companies of the group uh, should meet and have a common representative body. Okay, so also may play a role. Natural conditions, we already talked about a bit of that. You have to look to all of these things. Can an area be found to build a factory or an office building there? That's one of the simplest ideas. Which rules are there for um, the production? labor law, safety standards, production of the product, is it allowed or not, logistics, how are the streets, do you have railways, is there a haven which is fit for container ships. No. Still, uh, the waterways are one of the easiest and cheapest ways to transfer uh, huge amounts of goods and naturally you need havens and since container ships have been invented, um, naturally more and more goods can easily, easily be stored on one single ship. You know these enormous container ships and for these ships traditional havens are sometimes or harbors are sometimes no longer fit so you need new ports. Yeah. For example, um, that was one of the reasons why the infrastructure in Germany, um, the politics or policy for infrastructure also had to react. Um, there was some 10 years ago or 15 years ago, um, the Jada Weser port opened at Wilhelmshaven in the north of Germany, that is traditionally a harbor city. And this was then a newly created deep water harbor for the big container ships. Uh, perhaps the only harbor or port which is fit for ships of a future generation, which are even bigger than today's ships. But naturally, if now you have problems with that infrastructure aspect, um, for example, in case of the Jadeweser port at Wilhelmshaven, that was first that they finished the harbor and then um, it was still a problem. There was only one small railway, railway line going from the city of Wilhelmshaven to the rest of Germany. And now imagine you really take into operation one of the biggest harbors <laughs> and Enormous amounts of goods are um, brought there, and now the question is, well, um, how do I get them distributed to the rest of the country? And then the answer is, well, um, no, no railroads. Hmm. Only one single primitive railroad uh, connection, and um, hmm. okay, you need trucks and so on. Hmm. Um, surprise. Hmm. So that also highlights, by the way, how important infrastructure, infrastructure politics are for the welfare of a state. Imagine if you, if you find out that to, in order to be able to import raw material and to export your goods, you need a different kind of port in the future. You have to make that decision. You have to find a good location for the port. You have to begin constructing it. That takes 10 or 15 years until you are finished. So you have to look when you are 
responsible for politics there. You have to look widely into the future. What will people need in 15 years? And you have to put through the decision and then you have to imagine what you have forgotten. Um, so you should have motivated in that case of that harbor, naturally the railroad companies to start uh, constructing additional railroad connections. And because if you start to, con to create a railroad connection before you are finished with that, that also takes some 10, 15 or 20 years. You need to decide which railroad you want to have, where it should run. You need to buy all the land on that planned track. You have to remove all obstacles. Then you have to begin with construction. And that takes time and time and time. And then there will be unexpected delays. And so, so infrastructure is enormously important for the welfare of countries. And transportation aspects too and if you wait too long or over don't really overlook things and then <laughs> you wake up surprised at a certain moment of time and then find out oh um, we now have a problem you know, with respect or in comparison to our competitors from other countries we still have the roads and the streets and the railroads um, and the airports on a level which was sufficient 30 years ago, but now it's no longer sufficient, then more and more problems come up and you have no short-term solution for it. And that strongly affects decisions like where do I place a factory? For example, uh, I would never place a factory somewhere where I can foresee that in 20 years the transport opportunities or transport possibilities are no longer sufficient. By the way, what many people do not know, for example, is from the decision to build a factory somewhere till the moment when it can open, you have to expect that 10 years are going to expire. So, for example, somebody who evidently did not know that was the former Chancellor of Germany, Helmut Kohl, when in 1990 and 1989 to the inhabitants of Eastern Germany, he promised that within short time, Eastern Germany would be flourishing in the Western economy. And um, now in my studies, I also had been forced to listen to a lecture which was called Factory Planning. And it was absolutely clear. Well, if people would all have started to decide for a new location one day after German unification, on the 4th of October 1990, one day after the third, then probably in the year 2000, the first things would have been finished. So the idea was in short time, everything will be a paradise here in Eastern Germany was evidently either a lie or it was ignorant. Um, probably real life says with politicians you can expect lies but in, when it comes to economic, economics or so, um, here you can rather suppose it was ignorance. Probably the man couldn't know how long into the future such decisions have to be pre-planned. And you should also remember that you cannot start with looking for a location for a factory or so today when you need one tomorrow. There is a vast amount of preparations necessary. Okay, let's turn back to what is on the slide. So natural conditions, transport conditions, legal conditions. Are the laws of a certain country very complicated or not? Can you find out what happens? Um, or are many things unclear? You know, I want to foresee the consequences of my actions. Um, that has sometimes strange consequences. I heard that in America many, many um, firms decide to register a new firm under the law of Delaware. 
and um, they say the law of Delaware is relatively liberal and allows much things to companies. But what people then, when they become to get confident, what they then sell, uh, tell is, well, and Delaware has one additional aspect. Nearly everything which could be the reason for disputes has been ruled already by courts in Delaware. So the law of Delaware is not only liberal, but it is clear. Huh? All potential disputes have been already decided by courts. So the future is relatively foreseeable there. If, on the other hand, you have rules where many doubts are still connected with, you don't know how a court will understand them when it comes uh, to the worst, then this is not so attractive. All that plays a role, naturally. Laws on employment contracts, you will compare that. Um, is it more simple to engage a worker in Germany or in Spain? Uh, under which aspect can you dismiss these people? Um, and so on. By the way, all these differences are very often also an object for harmonization or coordination by the European Union because they want that the um, conditions for life in the different states of the European Union become more and more similar, which is usually a very um, positive aim of state policy. Uh, just to say we want that certain regions you know, stay behind the others for eternity. That's not social responsibility. Okay. Laws and production play a role uh, also what now people in England find out, the rules for exportation and importation play a role. When you produce your goods, the question is, can you send them abroad under reason, reasonable conditions? Which goods can you send to other countries? Sometimes you have legal rules which even forbid you to export goods from the EU. Um, for example, this is often the case when you produce goods which could also used for, be used for military purposes. Um, there are several countries where you are not allowed to deliver these goods from because then otherwise you would get problems with your home state. You are giving away military useful technology to potential enemy states. Is not done. Then customs duties. Naturally problem. You see, I have added a complete chapter to this um, lecture, chapter 11 or 12, 12, I believe, because I have found out that many people talk about international trade and don't know about the basic rules about international trade. For example, that borders have to be checked, that you have to find out if a good which comes from, let's say, England towards the border has really been produced in England or if it has its origin in Australia because probably with Australia you have agreed on different customs duty terms and all that is heavily complicated and the problem is you have to foresee that all. Mm -hmm. um, if your factory or your firm will be in operation in 10 years, how will be the conditions? Yeah. The last thing is international intellectual property rights. If you produce products which are um, protected by patent rights, will they be protected at the place where you go to? Or can any former worker of your factory leave your factory, know all your business secrets and set up then a competing firm just on the other part of the street, um, exploiting your knowledge? is probably not a nice thing. Prices, pays it all. And just to remind you of that, to go again to the beginning, when you come to decide, then you have different potential solutions. You can either look for a place where you can place all what you do, or you can say, I can split up my activities and 
distribute them all over the world so that a part of the things I have to do, uh, a bit of the labor is done in country A, another bit is done in country B, wherever the best conditions are, then you naturally are dependent on the transport connections and communication connections between these countries. You can then, for example, imagine what enormous shock it gives to firms if they, for example, opted for doing a bit of their production in England and doing the rest on the continent if then something like Brexit happens. All your plans probably now get a drastic change because you just had the idea we do something in let's say Liverpool and then the half-finished product is then carried to the continent and two days later production goes on in France or so. And now if you can't any longer guarantee that the time span is really two days and not more and the whole thing gets more complicated. Everything changes. More costs, more time, coordination will be more difficult. This is all something which you didn't foresee before, so you will have to show some flexibility. Or it might even be that you see, say in the long run, okay, a new factory. For example, the next one will not be placed in England anymore, but in Belgium, because then I have, again, the same conditions, perhaps, like before. Okay, so if you want to find a way, which is probably good, then Noel's recommendation is if you have a complex problem, dissolve it in all its individual parts and try to solve them individually. So and then compare. Mm -hmm. For example, if I don't produce a complete car at one single place, but the wheels in Japan and um, the engine in Hanover also, um, is that better? Which additional costs will that require for transport? And which cost-saving effect do I have from taking these different places or the two steps, for example, due to lower wages or so? All that has to be taken into account. Okay. So at the end, you see that when you have to decide about um, the, set, the place where you set up such a factory or part of your factory you have, again, to take everything into account, what happens in the enterprise, raw well, material, production, um, selling things to the market, mm -hmm. probably also management rules, finance management, mm -hmm. for example. Can I obtain the necessary money? Mm -hmm. um, what are the cost of transportation, the time increase? Everything is important and um, yeah every th um, development where you have the possibility to change the conditions uh, fundamentally for innovations in the area of transport of communication all that creates new different possible solutions in the area where you can place which part of your production and so that also um, entails globalization naturally. Good. That shall be enough for today. Um, yeah. It's not a really nice topic, but the more you think about it and the more you apply our basic theoretical framework about decisions on it, the more interesting detections you can make. Okay. That shall it be for today. And thank you very much for watching, if you survived this <laughs> video until now. And have fun with the rest of all the videos. Okay, goodbye.